Okay, guys, we're back here with uh, part three of our lecture over language. And when I left you in part two, we were on the profanity side of English words and and uh, whatnot. So I'm being delicate here. But um, thinking back to the, the shagging, The Spy Who Shagged Me, do you remember this, um, this film uh, from some time ago? Well, when this was released in America, what's the big deal? And the answer is nothing. Uh, but when you know that shagging is copulation, it's but it's it's a version of the word which would be like our f bomb. Okay, so when I say the spy shag, but you don't really have a reaction. But if you're a British English speaker, you're gonna you're gonna have a visceral reaction to this. And many of the English speaking countries in the conservative world, uh, say like Malaysia, which is dominated by Islam. They would not put the name of the uh, the full name of the film out there because it was that profane. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, we have our things here too. Uh, if you know anything about the vagina monologues, we ha we hosted it on our campus years ago, and there was pushback from the public to see the word vagina on the scroll outside at the front of our campus, and. They called our president to complain. But the point of the vagina monologues is, of course, to demystify this word. It's, there's no shame associated with it. And if you haven't ever seen the, that work of art, that play, you should. It was really good. And our, our professors and students, all females, got up there and, and did those renditions. And I thought they were just fantastic. But um, to, to, you know, to think that is offensive is part of our culture. And that's why I'm spending time on this with you. You know, buggery, to bugger off. That's another F word, but buggery is the back door, okay? Um, so you see some of these things, and they don't mean much to you, but we have equivalents that do have, again, potency within our language, and that's why I'm bringing them to your attention. Uh, finally dropping articles, you know, she goes to university, she needs to go to hospital uh, when they... You know, when they're saying these things, they're saying there's not just one. The the article for them would would mean the singular. There's only one hospital. And so they have dropped that article, uh, and you'd often see that. Um, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on this because I don't want to belabor the point. But I remember for Australian English, when the Sydney Olympics happened in 2000, um, a lot of the news organizations went down there. And there's all kinds of time to fill because the broadcasting every last bit of it. Uh, on television, but they asked, what, what's the word you use here that we, that you don't use here or that we use in America that has a different connotation? And they said, rooting. Uh, so in America, you would root for your team. You'd root for your favorite athlete. But rooting here, again, a sexual connotation. And so you wouldn't want to say that around here. Now, the last one I'll show you was South African English. I said I married outside of my race, and I married Indians who spoke Gujarati. But they were from South Africa. So whereas my wife only speaks English because she moved here when she was five, the older of their relatives speak at least three languages, if not four or five. So that's probably going to be English in South Africa, Afrikaans in South Africa, um, their own native language of Gujarati, and probably Hindi as well, if, if they're global business people, and most of them were. Uh, they had businesses, they had import-export companies and all this stuff. Anyway, uh, one thing, we were staying with her uncle, and my wife's uncle, and he was standing in his house. I want to show you here this geyser, okay? So he was standing in his kitchen and looking up at the ceiling, and, and there was water all over the floor. And I say, hey, what's going on? His name is Mohan, and Kaka they use, that means uncle, uh, a certain kind of uncle. Mohan Kaka, what's up? He says, oh, oh, man. The geezer's on the fritz. And I was like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> the geezer's on the fritz. And through a little discussion, I found out their water heater, that's what it was. So they call it a geyser. And it's hot water. Uh, and that it's on the fritz is it's, it's malfunction. And i got to get a guy over here to fix this thing. Um, but it was neat how we used words. Uh, we, we talk about whipping 
you know, a, a mean kid, they talk about giving their kid a hiding, if you see these words here. Just now doesn't mean just now. Just now means within a respectable amount of time, but in the immediate future or a little later. And that lecker, lecker is good. It was, it's all real good. Uh, I remember saying this too. I was at one of their barbecues. They call it a braai, B-R-A-I. And it was in their winter time, which is our summer when we were there. And the cookout had a big, they had a big fire out there. And one of my wife's cousin said he was cold and I said scoot up scoot up to the fire and you'll warm up and he this took him back many many years he'd been educated he'd come over and been educated in high school throughout high school in Kansas City and he said that was one of the first things that took me aback when I got here there was a kid sitting behind me in class and he tapped me on the shoulder and he says dude scoot up and we all know what that means in the same way that we know we're fixing to go somewhere in the South, we were always fixing to do something. Um, and he'd never heard this word before. And it took him back. And I said, well, don't worry. I didn't understand your words either. I asked earlier tonight for a napkin. And they all just fell out laughing. And, of course, a napkin can be anything from a nappy, a baby's diaper, to a feminine product. Um, and we just laughed about words and how they mean different things in different places. And so I think that's what I love most about, I don't know any languages, even really English that well, but I really find it fascinating in how, uh, like in China, if you look at the names of their provinces and different things, you learn a lot about the geography. It's about a direction. It's about its relationship to a thing like a river or something like that. So uh, just delving into English, it, it isn't only through English. It's through a lot of different things, okay? Now, how do we have system... Um, codified or systematic languages. See, if you look back, this is about Martin Luther and the German Bible here. And if you don't know to look right here, uh, so in uh, Wittenberg in Germany, but Martin Luther was the guy who, you know, put together Protestant religion. And it would be the Gutenberg Bible that was on the Gutenberg, printed on the Gutenberg Press and disseminated, well, that Bible then becomes what German language should be. You've got Austrians and, and you've got people, the German language was spread from Western Russia all the way over to the North Sea. And so to have it unified in a way, it had, it came about through religion. And so in seeing that this Bible codified the language, so was the same for the Quran. Uh, the Quran wasn't written until about a, a hundred years after the prophet Muhammad's death. We'll talk more about this in the chapter of religion. But it then became how all Arabic should be spoken or written. And so in looking at these kinds of texts and, and what impact they would have uh, on simplifying languages and making others go extinct, is uh is is telling about the history of how we talk and communicate okay so uh i'll move on from this it's really neat if you ever get to go to the taj mahal that means crown palace it's actually a mausoleum uh it was for shah jahan's uh favorite wife mumtaz she died in childbirth i don't know maybe of the 13th child she was having for him i i, I could be wrong on that but when you look in India, this is in India, Taj Mahal is in Agra, and this is this is one of the new seven wonders of the world, like from the Great Wall of China to the Roman Colosseum to Machu Picchu. These are the these are places that everybody in the world would like to see. Well, it's a mausoleum, but it's also uh, a pan to the religion. And so, if you look at the Mughal Empire in India, it's Muslim, okay. And so, diffusion of religion has an impact as well. This has been talked about, this this structure has been talked about as uh, a teardrop on the cheek of time. I will tell you though, it has not fared very well uh, in that this is a beautiful picture, uh, but I would say the Taj Mahal is good from far, but far from good. It's really shown some weathering and even the cleaning of these stones because of acid rain and, and atmospherics and all that was, uh, was uh, deleterious of the condition of the building itself. And believe it or not, 
dumbasses, and I'm going to call them that, dumbasses over the world will come and they'll take a knife or a key and they'll carve into this beautiful stone uh, work. And, you know, so-and-so loves somebody else on a date. And I was a bit um, taken aback by that and a little depressed by it, too. Hope you get to see it one of these days. It is a wonderful monument. I got to take three groups of students over here. Maybe, again, someday soon I'll lead some more uh, study abroads. But um, I hope you get to go see it at some point. Quickly, because I don't want to spend too much time on it, but understand that even as we will see that languages are dying, languages are also being created. Uh, Esperanto was created some time ago as as a universal language to to you know overarch all languages to to give us a common way of speaking with it, each other and not just saying de facto English or French or something like that is going to be the language we go to. But even Klingon has become an actual language. Um, and you can create your languages. Uh, uh, the J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Ring trilogy, uh, he created, you know, uh, it's a mythology, but he created runes and languages for his works of art, uh, of literature. So um, you can create your own language. You just have to follow the rules by it and be, you know. Uh, <laughs> so if you're, you know, you're industrious, Please, by all means, make one. I think it would make the world a richer place, not not a poorer one. Okay, so let's take a look here at the major dialects in North America. Uh, you could, I remember back in the '80s, there were there were movies and there was Valley Girl kind of stuff that would have been from California, like uh, like uh, I don't know, like uh, terrible movies, but and but those dialects uh i've already mentioned some in the south we mentioned the cajun uh down here uh sorry the cajun right here came from up here in acadia uh these new england sounds but certainly boston 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 yard uh harvard uh new york having their own uh yonkers this queens that brooklyn uh even pittsburgh has some of this and they're on that 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 defining defining line of southern Appalachian, because this is the Appalachian Mountains, so they're in there. It stretches all the way up here to the Gas Peninsula almost. Um, and so when you look at groups like the Gullah or the Cajuns out here, um, there's lots of different ones out in this area. Is Navajo and Hopi that we talked about, Kickapoo and and others in the previous uh, chapter two lecture. But uh, let's look at one, though, that is the African-American vernacular English, uh, knowing that this was called abonics back in the day, and abonics is portmanteau as well for ebony and phonics. <clears throat> this was the clipping of those languages, uh, of the English language, and it was actually adopted in schools to help children who didn't know proper English how to speak it. So speaking proper English to people uh, can be very difficult. And so let me uh, recount this story and then I'll hopefully let it represent what you're looking at here. I grew up in the sticks, guys. I mean, I was country as could be. And some of my relatives still are farmers and that's what they do. So these uh, cousins of my daughters, we see at family reunion, my daughters are always uncomfortable around them because they talked very quickly, but with a draw and clipped a lot of their words. And so I'd almost represent it like it sounded like they were talking through a mouthful of marbles. And my daughters would say, Dad, I, 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 don't, I don't know what he's saying. What's he talking about? And he had a hard time a little bit, or the, the boys, Daniel uh, and, and Robert, had a hard time with my girls because they spoke very proper English, mind you, that I tried to give them. Um, and so I was actually a translator for them at family reunions. Uh, and it doesn't take that long to change these things. And so understanding that uh, with just a generational change in me, you know, and education really changed the way I speak and, and how I would teach my daughters. And by the way, if you, ha if you don't have children, they can learn language very early on. So teach them sign language, even though they can't vocalize it they can learn that but also if they can learn the dirty words you know when you, you're mad at something and you, you flip out you know a, a bad word then know that they can work the big words too so that goo goo ga ga baby talk don't do that i'm i'm being honest here my little girls were t were speaking at a highly advanced rate when they finally started having words come out of their face and it was because I purposely gave them a, 
the biggest vocabulary I possibly could. So that said, uh, I'm not telling you how to raise your kids, but I'm letting you know they can be special. Well, they are special. Just give them the tools to be even more special. All right, I'll see you in the next lecture.